Right, hello and welcome to lecture 3 of the 7 part HC Bionet lecture series on conducting GWAS studies. Today's lecture will focus on array genotyping technology, which is getting raw data from a chip vendor, Illumina in this case, and using Genome Studio to call clusters from a raw data file and sample and probe quality control and cluster plots, and also the conversion of the data into print format for subsequent downstream GWAS analysis. For today's talk, we're lucky enough to have um, Aitan Nenchi, who's a senior bioinformatician, a software engineer based at the UCT Computational Biology Division in Professor Nicola Mulder's lab, and part of the AC Bionet project. After a brief stint in industry, um, Aitan got a bit bored and decided to come back to academia at UCT, where we do really cool things, and has worked on numerous projects, mainly focusing on human population genetics and genome-wide association studies. And Aitan has a wealth of practical experience with a wide range of array data and platforms. So for today's lecture, over to you, Aitan. Thank you. Thanks, Samir. Um, can everybody hear me? Is the volume decent? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of people clapping. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going I'm to go ahead and start. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, <clears throat> and thanks for the introduction, Samir. Um, this talk is going to be a li little less um, on the, the heavy science side and more on sort of the practical experience uh, we've gained from working with this data. Um, <clears throat> So let me get the controls right. Um, okay. So what I'm going to talk about is, um, as I said, the more practical issues of the array um, that we designed um, and processing that data, and some of the pitfalls to look for. Um, and I'll get to the reasons and so on. First of all, so. Um, I think this is this is uh, the, the audience for this talk is mostly people who are familiar with microarrays um, and what they're for and why they are useful. Um, but to just give a quick overview, quick background, um, the, basically a microarray is a device that has been created that does what what we call probe. Um, so it, it looks for variants in the genome um, and then reports back for each sample, whether or not um, that person has that variant, and also whether or not they are homozygous or heterozygous for that variant. Um, I put this picture here just to basically um, give uh, some background of, so you can imagine in your head sort of, you know, what the, what the, the physical background of, of the data is that you're working with. Um, it all boils down to actual wet lab things um, and wet lab technology and there can be noise in that. So one needs to bear that in mind and not blindly sort of trust your data. And so I think this has been covered before, but the, the, the Atria Africa chip, um, the, the reasons we created, um, we, we created a chip for the Atria Africa consortium was to better um, be able to read the genomic variation within African populations, particular projects within the HC Africa Consortium. Um, as has been mentioned before, um, and will be mentioned again, um, there's a lot of variation in African populations, and not all of that is captured um, with existing arrays. So just a, a brief, uh, quick background on, on the project um, and how we went about it. So um, we uh, collaborated with Illumina, which is one of the large manufacturers of genotyping arrays. Um, and it was a con consortium agreement to design custom content to put an array for the HC Africa consortium. Um, this HC Africa chip um, had parameters on what we could put onto it. and those were 
the whole chip um, has con can take content for about 2.5 million SNPs. Um, of, of that content, we had to select roughly 1.7 million um, probes from existing uh, Illumina catalog. And specifically, there were there, there were um, other 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 constraints to that that we actually had to select them in from the bead pools that they existed in. Um, so we uh, went about that and firstly selected those bead pools that we wanted, and that was sort of that was sort of the base content that we um, worked from. After that, we had a budget of you know, roughly. 700,000 um, content that we could add, and our options for that were to to have completely custom probes, or to also use content from existing Illumina chips. So the strategy we took was to um, take our sequencing data. We, we, we uh, the project for for this project we had um, reprocessed. Uh, uh, Sequencing data from roughly 5,000 samples, um, 350 of which were samples provided by members of the HF Africa Consortium. So we had this this basis of pure sequence data um, that we called uniformly and processed uniformly to get an idea of the variation within those those samples. And then getting back to our preselected content, how we sort of went about that. Um, we sent out an invitation for the PIs to give us lists of um, slips that they found of particular interest and that they wanted on the array. We also then did um, mining of uh, existing databases and catalogs. Um, we selected a, um, a subset of ancestry informative markers and then also a subset of Y and mitochondrial markers. The reason I'm, I'm speaking about this is because you'll see later on when, when, when we go into the Ray content, it's, it's worth knowing um, what the history of the probe is that you are looking at. Um, so, and then the remaining content, uh, we, we uh, selected probes um, to tile across the genome in the most informative way in terms of doing imputation. And so um, another subtlety on this is that when, when you're looking at a probe, one should bear in mind that um, it might have, that each little probe actually has its own story of why it's on the array. It might have been from novel sequence data. It might be from variants that we found in the sequence data, but it, is, um, it actually matches exactly an existing Illumina probe from their catalogs, in which case we would have taken that because it's it's, it's been um, proven to work, um, and so on. Um, okay, so then <clears throat> what I just wanted to talk about with this um, is basically the, the workflow I have in my mind when working with genotyping array data is that there are things that happen sort of beyond your control and happen before you even get to see the data. So that is sample collection, where there are things like sample labeling, phenotype gathering, gender relatedness, um, and so on, that can possibly introduce errors that one should be aware of and look for. Um, on the array processing, it's, it's usually done by um, an external facility, where they process the DNA, do the hybridization on an array, and possibly do the calling for you also. Um, and that can introduce things like batch effects, where the different plates they are on um, might affect uh, calling. Then down to genotype calling. If you're lucky, the the lab where you um, that you sent your array to has been calling already, um, and will provide you with, in addition to the the, the, the raw data, will also provide you with genotype files. Um, and what I'm, what I'm going to talk about today is basically going in and looking and seeing whether you are happy with the calling or whether you would like to redo it 
or refine it. Um, then further further on down, there's associate, association testing, um, your data conversion and your merging, merging of data sets. Those um, three specifically um, data conversion and merging data sets could introduce um, glitches, which uh, it's important to you know, be aware of it um, and, and be on the lookout for that. And then getting further down um, onto the imputation, the imputation accuracy depends on reference panels. Um, there are inherent errors in imputation. The reason I'm uh, bringing this up is because at the end, when one looks, when when um, the researcher is looking at significant um, markers, it's important to sort of be able to have that this whole picture in mind of you know where it came from. What's the what you know what what is the history of the marker? Was it is it an intuitive marker? Um, does it have a good plot, which I'll show later, and so on. So, yeah, the reason I the reason I've, I've put this up is because um, the most naive way and the easiest way would be to, if you're lucky, you receive a a, a plink file from the processing lab. And you just go ahead and do the GWAS, you do the downstream processing, and so on. Um, and you might not be aware of certain issues that might be there. Um, I think this has been covered, so I'm, I'm going to go over it very briefly. But um, basically, the concepts of SNPs and alleles genotypes um, in this in this diagram, um, basically a SNP is a position where there can be a uh, polymorphism. Um, alleles are the, the possible bases that have been seen there. Um, genotypes is the calls of each sample. What did, they, what did they have at that SNP? And then getting into what, we, what we'll be looking more into today is the concept of a probe. So a probe in, in, in this diagram is corresponds to this green line, and that is basically a complementary sequence of DNA that will match that uh, sequence. And on the end of it, it has a special bit of chemistry that looks for either a T or a C in this case. So um, as, you, as you can see, um, there are different places that a probe, uh, a probe could logically be placed. Um, and so that's also important to bear in mind um, and, and sort of keep, keep in mind of. Um, OK, so <clears throat> how can Genome Studio? Um, so in sort of bioinformatics, our, our culture is to more use tend towards open source as much as possible. Um, and there are some open source libraries that can process Illumina data, but they tend to be more, um, need more sort of expert uh, tweaking and so on. So Genome Studio is a good, is a good starting point. And another um, argument for it is that often the labs that are doing your genotype are using that. And so they'll distribute it with extra files intended for Genome Studio. So it's, it's good to uh, become familiar with it. Um, there are quite a few user features which are nice. Um, visualization, the, the idea of being able to integrate all the different annotations that are available. Um, there's obviously support from Illumina um, if there are issues or you know, questions. And it's just generally a good way to start. We are looking at um, other calling platforms um, and arrays and ways of working on the, the raw data. But this is a, a good, accessible way to work with your data. Um, then just a quick, uh, quick overview of file formats that we'll encounter in this topic specifically. So first of all, there's um, what are called IDAC files. Um, and these are binary files that store the intensity data from the array. So they can only be read with um, specialized libraries. And um, they do need to be processed to do the calling. 
I'll discuss more about that later. Um, but sort of your your requirements for what you would need if you receive data from a lab is basically just the IDAT files and then a binary annotation file, which is downloadable and um, you can also get from us. You might also get what are called cluster files. I'll, I'll describe those once we get into Genome Studio, but um, those basically describe where the clusters are of your particular step. And they're quite important and um, sometimes quite particular to your data set. Link formats, I think, has been discussed already, but um, it's a very common, common format um, uh, and it gets used by many of our pipelines. Another more recent format is uh, VCF, which um, can be, which gets used by quite a few file uh, tools also, and it has advantages that it um, is more explicit about certain things like strand and so on, which can sometimes hide subtly. Um, and then next one is an example of an annotation file. So. I mentioned the, the binary annotation file that you need to load into Genome Studio. Basically, that file just describes for Genome Studio, for every probe that there is, which snippet's actually targeting and um, what the probe sequence was, where it came from, what the genome coordinates are, and so on. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna, so if you can just picture that what I'm showing you right now is a text file version of that binary file. Um, so the, the, the sort of information that's stored in there is the Illumina ID. Now um, it's worth just bearing in mind that that is, that is a sort of globally unique identifier for that probe. And so one could have multiple probes for the same slip actually. They might be exact copies of each other. They might um, be two probes on different strands, or they might just, for historical reasons, um, have been created twice, perhaps, with different versions of different arrays. Um, it's worth reminding the, um, at this point that we have content from several arrays on our array, several older arrays. So just to look at um, sort of the subtleties of this, um, you can see there are some Illumina IDs that look like they are dates. Um, there are other ones that look like they are dates and perhaps suggest that it's on the mitochondria. There are um, other ones which are were created by us when we were adding our custom content. And so they um, have a little bit of you know extra detail. Um, but it's, it, it's worth sort of just bearing in mind then there's these KGP. My guess is those are from um, a project that was pulling them from 1,000 genomes data. The reason I'm going into this um, is just it, it, it's useful when you further down the line when you're looking at a particular slip. Um, one tends to need all the clues you can get on you know, why, why it is what it is. So for instance, um, I've been on uh, the, the slides scrolling. Yeah. So some examples of the Illumina IDs, and just to let you know an idea of the rich history one gets in these things. Um, as I said, there are some with dates. There are some which have the RSID embedded in it, and one can actually sort of see from that that it's probably an RSID taken from 131 of DB slip. Um, the thousand genomes one that I mentioned, mitochondria. I don't know what that one's history is, um, but one could go and look in basically which existing content it came from. Um, he has a nice clean example of an RSID. Um, then there's uh, H2 Africa IDs from sequencing data. Um, there are probes from sequencing data that have an RSID, that would not be ACE to Africa. Um, these are also sort of another format that people have done. 
So the, the issue I'm trying to explain here is that um, on the H2 Africa array, as I said, there's existing there's probes from existing bead pools, and those existing bead pools come from existing arrays that also have each of them their own design process and so on. Uh, one small thing I wanted to point out, uh, it's a, not the right example, but um, our H2 Africa request snips, so where PIs were requesting, um, had particularly you know, favorite snips that they wanted to put on. In the, in, in the manufacture process of, and the synthesis of the probes, um, there's, a, there's, there's a slight drop-off rate of, um, I think, about 10 to 20 percent. And so we were advised if we had SNPs that we really wanted to have on the array, one option would be to put it on twice. So in, in other words, design two probes and send them for manufacture and then hope that at least one of them goes through. So what that's going to mean is that sometimes you're going to um, encounter SNPs that are uh, encounter probes that are for the same locus. Um, and they might have different IDs, they might perform slightly differently. Um, but and sometimes you're going to encounter probes where there's actually only one copy and you, 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 it, it's got a name, you know, version two. That just means um, that the version one in that instance didn't make um, QC. So quickly into Genome Studio. So um, Genome Studio is a piece of software. It's uh, distributed by Illumina. Um, you do have to create an account, but it's free to use. Um, you do have to create an account to um, install it and get in. But basically, once you've got Genome Studio and you've got um, your data set from whoever the providers were, you should be able to load this in yourself. There are um, different levels of loading it in um, that you can get depending on whether you've got the cluster dates or not. So, uh, yeah, a quick walkthrough of the, the steps. Um, you basically say you want to do a new new project, you create it, um, you can see the option select from Linz is there, so that sort of suggests that this is uh, software that's often used more in the wet lab environment. Um, then you get given an answer for Use a sample sheet to load intensities or load intensities from the files. So you choose to load them from the files. And this page explains exactly the bare minimum of what one actually needs. So you point it to the directories which contain your IDAC files, just the IDAC files. And then you point it to the directory that contains your chip manifest. Something worth mentioning is um, that there are different manifest versions. We're currently the most recent one is A3, but there is an A A2, which was initially released, um, and we have found some issues with some of the probes on that. So that's something worth um, red flagging and just making sure that you know you have the right uh, the right annotation. These two annotation files, A A3 and A2, can both be used on the same array data. It's, it's just basically the metadata that's changed. Uh, next step is um, what additional things you want to import. And this is where I mentioned the clustering file. So sometimes if a lab has already done the genotype calling for you, they will have, um, in, in the folder, there will also be clustering cluster files. Um, these files are binary files, and they, I'm just going to skip the head so I can draw this, um, is they define where the expected um, genotype calls are going to be. So without that, um, if, you, if you've got data that hasn't been clustered yet, you're basically going to see only black dots in this example, um, none of the colored regions. Get into that more shortly. And so, once you're in Genome Studio, uh, basically this is the view of your data. And I think what I, what I'd like to sort of um, emphasize is that this is the bare minimum you should 
be able to do um, is even if you even if you have print data that is you know has been called and you're very confident about it and you go on and you do your GWAS and you do your imputation and you get results, the bare minimum you should be able to do is to take the snips of interest and go back either into Genome Studio or other plotting options and have a look at the actual plots of the probes and to see whether the calling is done well. Um, because there are issues which I can get which I'll get into shortly. So if the clustering hasn't been done, um, you choose analysis and then cluster all SNPs. That can take quite a few hours, but basically what it does is it um, examines each probe um, and all the samples within those probes and algorithmically tries to figure out what are the regions, what are the um, places where an, an AA, an AT, and a TT slip are expected to be from the data. And so the reason this is important um, the reason this is important to your data set is different labs might have different processing methods and they might have slightly more noisy data and so if you just blindly use cluster files that are not really appropriate for your data the cluster positions, you expect the cluster position is going to be off and so then your calling is going to be off. So that's where there's sort of a, a tight sort of relationship between um, the cluster files and your data yourself. So if you choose analysis and do clustering, um, it'll take sev several hours and it will basically, on your data, figure out where it considers to be the clusters for your probe. You can then also choose to save those cluster files if you'd like to. So uh, I'm going to look at some examples of problematic probes. Um, and this is why we, we um, why it's so important to sort of know your data and go dig in a little bit more into it. Um, so most of the mo most of the probes are good. Um, I'm just showing you the bad examples. Um, so this is an example of a probe that's non non polymorphic. Oh, um, well, look, so there are several reasons this probe could not be working. It could be that the probe just doesn't didn't hybridize well. It could be that the probe um, is you know, ha has completely the wrong sequence. Um, but it could also be that in your population, the um, the variant is fixed. So this, the, the processing of this data relies on comparing intensities between three different levels. And so, um, as you can see in the previous example that I had, um, there's a nice sort of clustering of three clusters. So from the eye, one can see that that, that probe seem, seems to be working well. Whereas this, um, it doesn't seem to be working well. And the trap here is that the processing has happily called it and happily given most of them an AA allele, some of them a no call. But one can be pretty sure that that's, you know, that's not accurate. Um, and so later on one does QC, but this sort of gives one an understanding of why the QC is important. Um, another issue is uh, the incorrect ploidy of the probe. So this is an annotation problem. Um, and again, it's, it's for historical reasons, um, these issues tend to be there. Um, but basically, um, this is a probe that is not our probe, um, but it's on our array. And if one looks at the clusters, OK, so first of all, you can see it's a Y chromosome, yet it's been annotated as 00, zero so which eliminates does to um, sort of mask out probes and say that it shouldn't be used. But the data is still there. Um, so if one looks at this, one can see that it's a Y probe. And so one's expecting two clusters. 
And there does seem to be quite clearly two clusters to me. And so the calling is not accurate on this, but um, it's basically an, uh, an instance of a probe that's working well. It's just not annotated correctly. Um, same again for a mitochondrial cell. Um, this time it's um, it's got correct coordinates. Clusters look good, but in the annotation file, um, it has marked as needing three clusters, and so Genome Studio is happily calling it as a as a deployed. Or and then getting further on the the sort of more subtle, more simple. Um, example is this probe has been annotated correctly. It is, it, we are expecting three clusters and if one looks at it you can see there are three clusters. But the cluster definitions seem to have been trained incorrectly so they are incorrectly marking um, this area as heterozygous. Perhaps because of this one outlier there that um, caused the expected AA has to be there, so it should be there. Um, and then a final example is um, probes that have multiple mappings. So uh, probes rely on the fact that the um, sequence that is used to bind is completely um, unique to that part of the genome. And obviously there are parts of the genome where there are repeats um, and for historical reasons, it might, that this might have not have been known. Um, the probes exist within the catalogs that um, probe, actually probe silently for two regions in the genome. And so what you're going to get there is you're basically getting three clusters, sorry, five clusters instead of three. And so in this example, in my understanding, this would probably correspond to um, a region that um, the probe maps, two regions in the genome that the probe maps to. <clears throat> Any questions at this stage? I'm about to go to the exporting. Um, so once one has set up this loop of where, where you have this data loaded in Genome Studio, you can do the calling again yourself. Um, you can look at specific uh, arrays, uh, probes of interest. Um, if you have done the calling yourself um, and you, you, you feel it's better calling, then the next step is to get it out so we can have it in our pipelines that we use. Um, and so Illumina um, Genome Studio has fairly limited options for sort of e uh, exporting. Um, and so the one to use is basically the reports analysis workflow, um, which will get it out into a text format that um, then can be used to convert. Um, these are the options uh, to choose, basically final report. Um, those are the columns. The most important is the SNP name sample ID and allele 1 and 2. Up the path, it does require, it, it makes a fairly huge file. Um, so make sure there's enough space. And basically the file you're going to want and get from that is this export report format, which basically has your SNP name. So recall again that um, that SNP name is this unique identifier for actually the probe. Sample ID, and then a little top and bottom. Um, or, sorry, the, the alleles for your sample, um, and then score. So this top-bottom format, um, how does it come about? Um, 
it's basically a necessity um, from necessity uh, for historical reasons. Um, as 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 I explained, um, you know these databases are have been created over years and projects, and they sometimes have inconsistencies in them. Um, one of those is the dbSNP database, where the first time a SNP was seen, it was submitted, and it was submitted on the bottom, uh, the, the incorrect strand. Um, and so you often do find sort of your older dbSNP entries. They will have, you know, 19 entries where the, the allele is listed as being on the forward strand, and then there's another entry where it's on the reverse. So it does happen that with, as dbSNP versions progress, um, sometimes SNPs actually change position um, or change orientation on the strand. Um, there are other re uh, re region, reasons this could happen. Um, for instance, the different builds of the human genome, uh, certain contexts might change the orientation between builds. So what Illumina came up with was uh, basically a way of unambiguously identifying the strand you are talking about, regardless of its orientation with, with regard to the reference genome. And so basically what they do with that is um, they have a rule where, depending on whether it is an AT or a CG in the, in the actual allele you're looking at, um, they then designate. So so, the, uh, so, so, sorry, these examples are the, the exceptions that made Illumina come up with this scheme. So, basic, the, the first rule is basically if you have a, an AC or an AG SNP, um, you can unambiguously identify the A strand as being what they call the top strand, and so on. Um, there are cases where what are called ambiguous SNPs. So in this case, it's um, SNPs where AT or CG are the alleles. And so then it's, it's not possible to sort of um, assign top because the reverse, the, the other strand of that is also going to be a CG. So then what they do is basically do a walking um, along of the further bases um, until they get to a pair that is um, not ambiguous. And then that is used to assign top and bottom. It takes, it <laughs> it takes some time to, to, to get one's head around it, and I think I'm still getting my head around it. Um, but there are, there are some good resources on this. Um, and those are the two links I've given here. Um, one is just the Illumina Tech Note, which describes it, and then there is a. a Um, so, um, once you've exported your data into this Illumina format, um, one is um, able to then go back to the GWAS workflow and use the top-bottom Nextflow script to convert those. Um, there are good instructions on the uh, on, on the GitHub repo, um, but it's it's fairly simple to use. Um, then some troubleshooting. So I've mentioned a lot of these um, issues already. Um, as I said, bad annotations. So um, for historical reasons, they can come up, come from many different places. Um, and so it's just worth bearing in mind when you're looking at your SNPs, um, what are the possible things that could have gone wrong? So like I said, legacy probes, incorrect position location, um, top bottom versus forward reverse. So this is, as I explained uh, above, um, 
when you get your pink format, which is a very, very um, uh, simple format, um, it's not possible to distinguish how it's reporting these, um, how it's reporting your markers. So it's possible that there can be confusion, um, and somebody can give you data in top bottom format, and uh, you're expecting forward reverse. And that can lead to very subtle mistakes. Um, and so my biggest sort of advice for that is be careful of, you know, be aware of warnings. If you if you are merging data sets um, and Pink is complaining about it, don't just flip them. Understand the problem. Um, understand why it's coming. It might go back to some historically one or two examples that were just poorly annotated, um, but it, it it might indicate a deeper problem in your data, um, and it's important to go find those and not just take the options that some software give of just you know swapping and flipping, um, because that can hide things. Um, from my experience, also what I've seen is in in snip array data, um, the tricky ones are what we call ambiguous probes. And bigger SNPs, and so those are the AT or CG SNPs, and those are ones where um, you're not going to see this when you merge it with other data. If if they're on the wrong strand, if the one data set is on the wrong strand, you're not going to see it. Um, and so things like Plink are going to warn you about ones it's found, but you can't just tell Plink to swap and flip them because you won't be flipping the AC or the CG. Um, as far as numbers are concerned, it, it seems to be that there's it's it's not an even percentage of probes that on, on arrays that are you know divided between the different allele combinations. So ambiguous ones, AT and CG SNPs, do tend to be far fewer on the arrays. Um, so the reason I'm saying that is um, if, if you if you're doing if you're processing a data and and you're seeing a small percentage um, that's less than the expected percentage, um, still be skeptical um, because you might have this issue there. Um, and yeah, then, uh, yeah, what I've been sort of trying to communicate the whole time with this is um, be critical of the data. Um, try to understand things, try to um, understand why things are not what you expected. Some resources uh, we found useful. Um, so we've developed um, sort of to 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 basically um, integrate a lot of this information. We've developed a website. Um, with your always now type it in. Um, Chipinfo.hcabionet.org, um, and we've developed this to basically start to be a one-stop one place where one can go look at um, particular SNPs on, on the array uh, and why they were there and so on. So some of the features it has, um, we have a probe orientation visualization, um, which is basically taking the, the, the annotation information from the annotation file and trying to sort of communicate where the SNP is and where what the probe orientation is. Um, some SNPs have have a type two probe, um, which means they actually have two probes, and so we also um, indicate that by a blue probe. Um, and so this probe orientation can change depending on the probe. And then top bottom versus forward reverse is also indicated by this black versus gray. It's, and then also useful is once if you if you if you're looking at this probe um, is if you want to know why it was on the array then to go to the design request and click on that and it will show you um, more information about why 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 the array was actually put on the chip why the probe was actually put in the array um, then also there's this, this probe plot button, um, which is basically the same view that was in Genome Studio, 
Um, but I was finding it frustrating to jump between Genome Studio and the extra um, sort of information we have on why we designed arrays. So um, I've made this to export um, probe plots. The data you're seeing in this is um, some control data that was provided by Illumina. It's um, HapMap samples. So it can be um, you know, safely made available. Um, but it's, I mean, you know, so, so you, you, uh, you might want to use your own data on this. Um, if you do, contact us and we can work on a way of loading this in. Um, but it's, it's a good sort of first stop is to basically look at the probe and see has it been working. And then the last thing I added was um, uh, there's a link. I can't see it in the screenshot, but there's a link to um, EVA browser. So everybody has their own sort of favorite annotation sources. Um, this is the this is the one that I use quite a bit, um, and so it's uh, it, it can be helpful to sort of use these two together. When you're basically looking at your probe um, and you see something funny, um, basically in a new tab, click on the link and open up the variant itself, um, and that'll contain links to other things, um, other resources. And I mean, obviously, you're not going to do this for thousands of your probes, but um, at, at some point, one does find interesting ones, and then one needs to double check and sort of make sure something funny hasn't happened. Um, yeah, so that was um, basically my experiences of working with the chip data so far. Um, any questions? If you'd like to ask questions, you can sh type your questions in the chat box and we'll go through them one by one to try and answer them. We put on YouTube and the link will be contained in the MailChimp ad, so when it's sent out next time, you'll be able to access the lecture from the issue by Net YouTube channel. From Dr. Fozia Rodani, uh, does the selected issue Africa SNPs were related to known African diseases? Um, so they were they were chosen on their clinical significance, um, broadly within the GWAS catalog, and then also. Um, filtering for whether or not they had been seen to be um, variants in our populations.
Okay, um, Samir just showed me the questions. Um, from the difference in the identifier names, I get the sense that one specifies their Illumina identifier. I'm not quite sure I follow the question. Um, so, um, the difference in the Illumina names um, is, is and in the difference in the patterns is, um, Basically, for historical reasons, so um, which 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 projects um, created them and so on. And so, obviously, it, it can happen that one um, different project see the same variant and want to add it and design it. Um, and so, they had to come up with, um, or well, they had to provide a sort of unique identifier. Um, and so, in the design process, what one actually does is you submit. Um, this this name, um, which has to be unique, and so you see people um, doing tricks like um, snip minus rs rs is probably being used before, so um, one ends up you know doing tricks by adding your own extra things to make it unique. Then Illumina goes through the the manufacturing process and. They assign to it um, a further unique, um, more unique identifier, um, which contains a bit more information. So, um, if it, I'm interpreting this as if it's if it's seen if it was seen in, they checked it in DBSNP 142. Um, it's on the bottom and reverse strand, and that is a unique identifier. So, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, the both of these identifiers are in Genome Studio, um, along with RSIDs. But RSIDs are, you know, um, DB snip changes, um, so they're not completely reliable to be completely unique. So it depends on what you're looking at. If you're talking about the actual probe and its performance, and you're looking at that, then the Illumina ID is the thing to be speaking of. Um, if one's talking about a variant, um, which is what people reporting want to do, then one would use the more sort of canonical identifier, which is the DB snip ID. Um, Fusa has a question. Um, so, SNP should be designed according to the project and aim. Um, to a, to a certain extent, um, I think uh, the, the well, um, the probes. So I, I, I gather you're asking about the probes, um, and so the probes um, are designed um, according to what variants you are looking for, and you know where that is, um, and there are um, sort of subtleties in that, um, which often the design process does for you. So, for one snip at one place, um, there's those flanking sequences. And so, computationally, one can examine those flanking sequences and see whether they are unique. Um, uh, also, look at the sort of, um, I believe, the hybridization, predicted hybridization properties, and also look at whether there is a snip within, uh, you know, another snip. Um, so th there are some issues with designing the probes, but um, you know if if you want your your certain SNP, um, there's a good chance one can design a probe for it because you'll find a flanking region. There are some SNPs which are right next to indels or so on, um, where it seems one just can't design a probe for that SNP. And then what you would do is choose variants fairly close to it um, and design probes for those and hope to be able to impute uh, the missing variant itself. Um, as, as far as I think, I think uh, if your question was about whether 
um, SNPs probes have to be designed for a particular disease? Um, no. Um, they're basically probing the genome and giving you the genome from that. Um, so if it's if it's covering the region of interest, um, then and the probe works, then it's it's valid. I don't know if I answered your question correctly. Uh, Lissetti was asking about uh, other other software other than Genome Studio to visualize the intensity plots. Um, not that I not that I know of. Um, there are are libraries um, for reading tabular data um, from the the Illumina format, um, and the Illumina format is also fairly um, flat and simple. The export format. So this software, this 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 chip info site that we made, um, it it basically reads in data that's been exported from Genome Studio. In Genome Studio, you can export the um, the actual probe intensities, and so it can be done. Yes, um, but get in touch with us if you if you have a particular thing you want to do with the data. Um, Miriam asked, according to the map, the design of Africa chip that don't cover the majority of African countries. Yes, um, so it's a, it's a historical problem that um, a lot of the variation on the African continent has not been um, properly explored yet. Um, and so we took um, samples, um, basically we used data from the Thousand Genomes Project, um, um, some Sanger Institute projects uh, that looking at African populations, um, and then projects within the HC Africa Consortium um, that were able to give us uh, samples. So yes, there's, there's still variation um, that has not been gathered. Um, Um, so, Nazim is asking, what is the source of the incorrection in the ploidy? Um, that's that that's completely an annotation problem. Um, so, um, we believe it's actually the the, the bead pool manifest um, because when you load it into Illumina Genome Studio. It um, tells you what the expected clusters are, and for the mitochondrial SNPs, it gives them as three, which we expect to be two. Um, so one can go in and change that, and then recluster um, if, if you're looking specifically at those. But um, specifically at the the non-autosomal markers, um, we actually think um, it, it's better to look at those more carefully. Um, and individually and use other calling um, algorithms to call those. So in general, this, this data set, um, uh, this software is probably best used um, for the autosomal steps and more sort of um, considered processes used for Y and mitochondria. Uh, Sean has pointed to a visualizer of yes. Thank you, Sean. Um, and there's a question about quality control. Um, so yes, I didn't go into that um, too much because um, it, it, it's used um, quality and control. There, there are a lot of um, places where quality control is done. Um, so, in, in this particular context, um, 
uh, I would say quality control is more um, done in the sense of looking at your samples um, as an overall, seeing what the call rates are, um, filtering on that, and then filtering markers. Um, but one, there's there's a there's a tension between um, you know what not wanting to throw those steps out too soon, and so uh, further on in the GWAS um, pipeline, there are also quality control measures that are formed. So I would maybe err on leaving them in and uh, and understanding the, the downstream um, parameters and using those more. Uh, ESO has a question about criteria for defining top button um, and forward reverse. Um, no, it's much um, much. The forward reverse is much simpler. So it's, it's the, I think um, <laughs> unless I don't uh, unless I'm not, uh, I don't understand something, but um, forward reverse is basically what the the published human genome is. Published as, and, and there it is assigned uh, a forward strand and a reverse strand. So what I, what I'm trying to show in this um, other visualization is basically the orientation. Um, basically, putting the forward always on the top strand, and the reverse always on the bottom. So it's a canonical, it's, it, it's a defined one. Um, and then again, mention, as mentioned, um, resources. Uh, it was mentioned in a, another lecture. There's the help desk. So um, if you have sort of more detailed questions, or if you want to chat, there's um, there's the help desk, um, and there's a specific topic for uh, chip processing questions. So we're happy to help with that. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, and sorry to the University of Khartoum note for the poor sound and audio quality today. We'll get to the YouTube lecture as soon as we can. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much, Ethan, for a very excellent lecture, and I've certainly learned a lot. Um, I'm going to exit the meeting room right now. Please um, fill in your registration and your attendance to this lecture at the online form that opens once your browser shuts down. So thank you so much for everyone attending, and once again, thank you so much, Ethan, for a lovely lecture. Thank you. Thanks everybody for attending.